Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Bob Bruner, and I am the Exotic Forest Pest Educator with the Department of Entomology at Purdue University. Today, I want to be talking to you about one of the prettiest, if not one of the worst, invasive plants that we have to deal with here in Indiana, known as the multiflora rose, or by its species name, Rosa multiflora. This particular rose has a pretty long and storied history throughout uh, much of the world and in Indiana. It is native to Japan, Korea, and China, and it's been introduced as rootstock as an ornamental throughout several portions of the world, uh, especially during those periods of time where people were developing new rose stocks. Uh, many of the modern ornamental roses that you know now do originate from Rosa multiflora. That is their progenitor, and they have been split in different trait lines have come from there. It also exists in its wild state and has been used as something to prevent erosion or sometimes even as wind breaks, depending on where you live. Um, but unfortunately, the uses that we have gotten out of that have been far overshadowed by the fact that multiflora rose can easily spread and can often be very destructive to ecosystems. Now this rose tends to thrive in areas with well-drained soils, so depending on where you live in Indiana, you may have bigger problems with this as versus others. So for example, where I'm recording right now, this is an area with fairly well-drained soils, so we get quite a bit of multiflora rose. Though areas located around some of the Great Lakes and other places around rivers may see less of that depending on the composition of your soil and what the wetlands look like nearby. It is able to fairly easily invade old fields, pastures, roadsides, and particularly forest understories. Um, and I've had the opportunity to do some work with local state parks trying to map out how this particular plant has spread throughout forest understories in those areas. It is very aggressive. It can grow very quickly and is able to spread very, very easily either through seed. It is a rose, so it does have rose hips or through layering of the canes. And I'm going to explain in just a moment what that means. Now I mentioned this a little bit before that Rosa multiflora or multiflora rose has been used to create different ornamental roses. Uh, one example that I like to talk about are polyantha roses. Um, the home that I live in right now, we have a polyantha rose that's growing right by our front door. So that polyantha was created by crossing Rosa multiflora with Rosa chinensis, and that's where that trait line originates from. This is a very common garden rose. It does not share any of the environmentally damaging traits that its ancestor does. So that really kind of tells you a story there that just a few traits of difference, just a little bit of selective breeding, suddenly took something that's an incredibly nasty invader and turned it into the basis for many of our more beautiful ornamental varieties today. Not only more beautiful, but also more resilient too, because you'll find that polyantha roses create the basis for things like knockout roses and other breeds that are able to survive in Indiana's environment. So why don't we work first a little bit on the identification of multiflora rose. Um, just because it is a rose doesn't mean it's going to look like all the others. And as you know, many roses have traits that can vary quite a bit between them, whether you're looking at something that's a grandiflora rose or if you're looking at something that's a knockout. Multiflora rose, like I mentioned, is a rose. It is an actual rose. It belongs to rosaceae, so it has traits of all of its uh, fellow roses, including rose hips. So the, for those of you who don't know, this is where seeds are developed after roses have gone through their bloom period. The hips, like most roses, are going to last through the winter. Seeds will need to be cold stratified in order for them to develop. Each hip produces seeds that can persist for more than 20 years or up to 20 years in the soil. That means that they are extremely durable. Um, those seeds will remain dormant and they'll become active once they, the, the environmental conditions are correct. But it also means that a seed bank can develop and remain very easily in the soil. Uh, so if you're attempting to work on your eradication efforts, you're going to be working on this for quite a few years as you make sure that you are removing as much of that seed bank as possible. You can fairly easily recognize the rose hips of multiflora rose because they do have that familiar balloon shape as many rose hips have. They're also red in color, so just look for the tiny bright red balloons at the end of the plants where the flowers once were. 
Now, as for the canes, the canes are perhaps the most easily identified portion of multiflora rows for some pretty specific reasons. And right now, the image in front of you is kind of telling you that story. The canes are very wild. They are very, very dense and they will create thick barriers that will prevent the movement of wildlife and certainly people, as well as push out the ability to develop other plants. Now they can grow anywhere between 6 and 13 feet in length, and I personally have seen a few instances where that number has definitely been passed, so they can get quite large. The tips are green, and when the tips come into contact with soil, they will begin to re-root into a brand new plant in the process that I mentioned earlier called layering. So you can imagine as these canes get larger, they bend towards the ground and they do layering, and then they will develop more canes off of them, and they'll just spread and create this massive briar that kind of looks like what you see in front of you right here. Um, I have personally been through state parks and other areas that have infestations, multiflora rows that look just like this. And I can very safely tell you that the thorns on these uh, brambles are just absolutely crazy how nasty they are. Um, I've actually guided classes and other things through there showing off the roses and I've had to instruct people to be very careful because these thorns will very readily grab onto you. They'll damage your clothing and they will definitely damage you. Now I kind of went over this a little bit here saying layering can cause a very thick briar. Uh, one of the keyest things to remember too is that that briar is effectively impassable. Animals and people cannot get through them, and it also means that they block out sunlight, so they're creating a really good barrier to allowing any other plants to develop. So you could see massive briars of multiflora rose just absolutely take over a landscape, say an opening in a forest understory, where they just fill in and they take it over completely. Now the other way we can identify multiflora rose is through the blooms. I mean, it is a rose, so it will have traditional rose-like blooms on it. They do like to produce blooms that are very showy. They're going to be either white or pink, kind of like some knockouts will look, and they will be fragrant. Um, you will look at this plant and think it is very pretty until it begins to form those massive briars. Typically, we will see them bloom May through June, so essentially, at the time of this recording, we are about to see blooms occur, though I have not personally seen any yet come up. And for note, it is currently uh, very early May in 2023. One thing that is also important to keep in mind, and I'm going to focus on this a lot more later, is that they will be one of the first plants to leaf out during the spring. Speaking of leaves, Leaf identification follows a similar trend to other roses. You are going to see leaves that are opposite each other. They are not alternate, they are opposite. They will be pinnate with a toothed edge with 5 to 11 leaflets on a given leaf. And they're going to typically be about 1 to 2 inches in length. So this is actually not too much different from most other roses, but it does provide an easy way to identify it. So if you're out in the middle of the road, in the woods, I, pardon me, um, you're not expecting to see a rose developing, but if you see a plant that has rose leaves growing in the woods, you can be fairly safe in assuming that this is probably multiflora rose developing. And then, if we go back to what I was mentioning earlier, this plant developing in the middle of woods, the image you're seeing in front of you right now is drone footage that I took in April of 2021. So this was during the COVID pandemic. I was had to be out in the middle of the woods by myself with a drone, which... I personally had no problem with. I enjoyed it quite a bit. Um, but what I was doing was I was helping uh, McCormick's Creek State Park track their multiflora rose development and try to map it out for them. And what you're seeing here is that anything that is below the canopy line of the trees that's green is multiflora rose. So you can use this image and assume that there's quite a bit going on here. So one of the things that McCormick's Creek State Park and many of our state parks in Indiana do is they often have seasonal help to fight the good fight against invasive species. Um, one of the big ones has been Asian bush honeysuckle, and right alongside it is multiflora rose and many other species that are very problematic. These plants can choke out our native tree development in those areas, and they kind of ruin the, the purpose of the park. They literally become impassable. Um, so they, the state park staff does a lot of work to try to clear these out. So a couple years back when I was an extension educator with Purdue Extension, I helped them map out areas using my drone flying overhead 
and just taking imagery and footage of it so that way they could use that to create a work plan for themselves. Now what you're seeing here is I'm highlighting an area that clearly has multiflora rose developing in it. Um, you have a canopy opening where sunlight's coming into the forest floor and the rose is just taking absolute advantage of that starting to grow as much as it can since it's the first one out and greening up it's able to get quite a bit of sunlight time in. The trees won't leaf out yet for quite a while. They're not going to come into their own canopies until mid to late June where they're going to get good canopy coverage. Um, even now, at the time I'm recording this, the trees that I see just outside my window aren't that thick yet. They're only still developing leaves, so multiflora rose in my area is probably taking full advantage of that. So the question is, how do we begin to control this? What can we do to try to eliminate multiflora rose? Unfortunately, this is one of the hardest invasive species to try to control. There is a lot of time and a lot of effort you have to put into it, and you're going to have to come at it from several different directions. So I would definitely not recommend trying to tackle this as an individual. Um, Multiflora rose is a briar. It is thick. It usually requires some equipment to try to remove unless you catch it young. Um, it can regrow from roots, so it becomes imperative that you get the root system up as much as you feasibly can. And like I mentioned earlier, that seed bank is very strong and it persists for a long time. So once you start the battle against multiflora rose, it will be going on for a long time. Particularly severe infestations can be really, really challenging to navigate too, because if you're on it by yourself, or even with just a couple other people, severe infestations are thick. They're impassable. So you have to get equipment, and you've got to make a plan to be able to eliminate this, because just going at it day after day may not get you very far. So let's start with the most basic form of removal, just mechanically removing it. So if you have a small infestation, you can remove it by hand. You need to remember to watch out for the thorns because they do have really nasty thorns. And you need to remove as much of the root system as you can. And even then, you still need to go back because there is no absolute way to remove the root system. You're going to miss portions of it. So you're going to have to revisit year after year to make sure you eliminate it. And like I said earlier, if you've got a big old bramble that's growing in, you need that equipment to be able to get that root system out of the ground and destroy all the connections between the canes where they've done layering. Now, if you choose to do mowing, mowing's going to be best done when the plants are younger. Remember, this is a rose, so it's a woody plant, and mowers are going to get torn up by it if, they're, if it's too intense. You need to mow about three to six times throughout a season, and this can be kind of costly or time consuming, depending on the level of equipment you need to get this mowing done. Now, you can also choose to excavate it using a backhoe, a bulldozer, or a tractor and a chain. But again, you need to get all those roots and you need to do immediate follow up treatment with an herbicide. Um, I know that herbicides may be distasteful to a lot of my listeners right now, but unfortunately, when it comes to an invasive as virulent as this one, it's really not an option. If you have an intense infestation, you must treat it, or else you're just wasting your own time and energy. Now, I have been asked several times in the past, what about biological control for multiflora rose? Unfortunately, the options are fairly limited, and right now they are still in research phases. One of the biggest ones that's being looked at is rose rosette disease, sometimes referred to as witch's broom. It's very common in all kinds of roses, ornamental or wild roses, including multiflora rose. Now, it can cause telltale reddening of leaves and tips, and it can give the uh, plant the traditional witch's broom appearance, and I'm going to show you what that looks like in a moment. It's spread by a mite species that will attack roses, so that way it's carried by a mite to another plant. And this is what it looks like. You can see here that the plant's biology has just kind of, kind of gone crazy. It will have kind of a switch broom like appearance. Um, it will definitely not look pretty at all. It won't look anything like the rose you want. And you can see that very distinctive discoloration and the unusual growth in this image. Now, the good thing is, is that if you're dealing with an infestation in the middle of the woods, you're not worried about ornamentals nearby. It's not going to be affecting them. So that gives it potential as a biological control agent. But if there are ornamental roses nearby, this is definitely not something I would recommend to use. And right now it's not on the market yet. So we're going to give this time and see where that research takes us. And here I put a little more about rose rosette disease. It's important to keep in mind, like many diseases, 
This will not kill a plant. It'll keep growing, but it will very severely weaken them and it's gonna reduce their ability to reproduce. That's the important part. Hopefully it will weaken them enough where you can simply remove it later on in a following year as the plants weaken by cold stress and its inability to prepare for the winter. It can easily spread through plants. Remember, there is a mite that will spread this one, and which means it can spread to your own ornamentals. So don't think that you can take like maybe an infection in an ornamental plant and spread it to multi-floor rows without really, really thinking about what you're doing. And I would not advise doing that at all. You know, leave it to products that are labeled for that purpose. And then finally, some chemical control. So the good thing is, is that multifloral rose does respond to traditional products that contain glyphosate, triclopyr, and melt sulfur on methyl. So product names for that would be something like Roundup or Tordan. So before application, I strongly suggest that you mow or cut the plants. That way you can induce stress, you can wound them, you're weakening them, and you're reducing the amount of surface area that you need to treat. You also need to plan all of your applications with the timing in mind. You wanna make sure you're hitting these at the right uh, portion of the season. Remember, remember, these plants will leaf out early and they will also senesce or lose their leaves fairly late in the season. They're gonna last a long time. So we're wanting to aim for periods of time when we're going to take advantage of the plant at its weakest points. Now, foliar treatments can be done anytime during the growing season. So you're looking to go ahead and treat when the plant has leaves on it. But you need to keep in mind that you're going to impact other vegetation when you do so, unless you are extraordinarily careful. Um, if, you're, if I were the one doing a foliar treatment, I would kind of aim towards the beginning or ends of the season there where the fewer plants are going to be up, and that way I could limit that damage and make sure I'm hitting my target. Cut stump or cut stem treatments and basal bark treatments can also be done at any time. But again, I like doing that. I, I like the idea of doing those more towards the fall myself when everything else is dead, or at least going into dormancy. Now, some of these treatments may have different timings based on the medium that you're using, for say, like using a pesticide with a water carrier versus an oil carrier. Um, but what I have here now is a handy chart to help you. So this is put out by, this is actually mislabeled. Here it says the Southern Indiana Cooperative Invasive Management. That is actually now the State of Indiana Cooperative Invasive Management. So I will have to make sure in the future to update this properly. As you can see, this came out in March of 2019, though I don't think the information has changed at all since then. What we want to focus on is this top portion of this chart here. So you can see in the little red box on the left, I've highlighted multiflora rows. And this is the proposed treatment schedule that Sikkim, um, as they're called, is using here. So they're suggesting May through September using that foliar spray. So this means that you are doing that application. You're doing it when the plant is green and you are stopping when the plant stops being green sometime in late September. And at that point, everything else is beginning to lose its leaves or already has lost its leaves. As for the cut surface or cut stump treatments, you're doing that June through March. That way you have a wide range where you can treat that safely and not affect other plants. And then the basal bark treatment is also effective later on in the season, September to March. So you're basically aiming for fall through winter there to handle that. You can also look around a little bit more and you can see the recommended chemicals that they're suggesting here for foliar. They're suggesting glyphosate for the cut surface treatment. It's glyphosate and water. And then, of course, the basal bark is triclopyr and a horticultural oil. And I've kind of highlighted those already. All right, so that is what I have for this one here. Um, I want to let everybody know if you spot any invasives, particularly ones like spotted lanternfly or Asian jumping worm, to please call 1-866-NO-EXOTIC to report those. You don't have to worry about reporting multiflora rows. We already know it's spread throughout Indiana, and we're working on that one. But for some of our newer invasives, please let us know where they are so that way we can get to them. And with that, I'm going to say everybody have a good day and stay safe out there and have a great spring.